Hello, everybody. This is um, David Huckabee. I am um, recording our first episode here for Matt and Oya and kind of cross posting on our Catholic Converts Instagram page. Um, just like I said, we're going to have a testimony Tuesday, every Tuesday, where we're talking about different um, aspects of our faith, whether it be Catholicism, Christianity, um, reverts, converts, anything in between. And um, I wanted to invite my um, dear friend, Jose Benitez, with me tonight. He is, um, we met on the um, Catholic Converts page on Facebook, I believe. Um, yeah. He said he was a, a wacky Pentecostal. And so I was like, oh, I'm a, a hello. <laughs> I was one of those. Just kidding there. But um, so I've really been blessed by Jose's friendship in the last um, month or so. And so I thought that we would have a lot of, um, he has a lot of good insight of what the charismatic movement is doing now in both the um, the Catholic world and um, outside the Catholic world in the Protestant world as well, and also the Pentecostal world. You you attend a, a Assemblies of God Church, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as of yeah, as of uh, summer of uh, twenty uh, twenty two. Yeah, uh, my actually actually close uh, twenty twenty one. My bad. Um, uh, my family and I started attending a you know, local assemblies of God church. Uh, prior to that, uh, I had been attending a a church that was formerly a, an independent charismatic church. Uh, actually, grew out of the Jesus movement here in Delaware. You know, back oh, okay. in the seventies, and then that church. You know you know, in the, around the early mid nineties, you know, got involved in the, you know, Toronto, you know, blessing renewal and fast forward, you know, a little over 10 years later, uh, that church, uh, joined the vineyard. So I was at a vineyard at that church pretty much since the mid late, really more since the late nineties yeah. prior to going to our current church. And for those that aren't familiar, the Vineyard um, Fellowship is a um, charismatic church. It was a big movement in the 90s. And still today, I mean, there's thousands of Vineyard churches everywhere. Um, I did a quick shirt, um, search over the DFW Metroplex area, and there was uh, only a couple of Vineyard churches. But back in its heyday in the Metroplex, there were everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I remember us going to a lot of those. We, I, w I didn't grow up personally in a vineyard church, but we were close, close to it, you know? Yeah. And so we did a lot of things with the vineyard fellowship and my dad um, saw John Wimber several times and went to his conferences. John Wimber was the founder of the vineyard movement. So, you know, he sadly passed away. I guess in the mid nineties, I can't remember when, but it's uh, that in Calvary um, chapel, would you think would be like the biggest charismatic um, fruit of the Jesus movement? Yeah. Would you say that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but let's talk about you. What would you describe was your religious background? Were you, were you always charismatic or were you, so I, I like to tell people I'm a bit of a mutt, you know, cause, uh, <laughs> cause of my upbringing. Well, so when, uh, when I was born, uh, my family at the, you know, and when I talk about my family, I'm speaking mainly about, you know, my, uh, mom's side of the family on my mom's side of the family, they were involved with the, with the Methodist church in Puerto Rico at the time. But, you know, that particular, Methodist Church, I guess you know, during that time frame was involved. I guess you could say in the uh, uh, charismatic renewal. You know, you know my, you know my grandparents and other uh, family members. You know, they 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 would, they would tell stories that are were just like book of Acts, you know, type of things. You know, you know going going on in the context, you know, of the church, but also outside of the church. You know, prayer meetings going on and someone would get 
you know, a word of knowledge that, okay, we're supposed to get in a car and drive, you know, to this place, you know, this street, this house, and, you know, boom, you know, God would, you know, would lead them to whoever needed um, being ministered to, you know, people would get healed, people would get delivered, you know, so they were seeing that stuff as Methodists, yeah. you, know, by, you know, my mom's side of the family. On my dad's side of the family, uh, my, you know, my dad's, you know, dad, you know, grandpa on that side, um, when he got saved, you know, he shortly after became a Baptist minister, but then he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Baptist kicked him out. So he became a <laughs> Pentecostal, you know, and then, you know, my dad, you know, became, you know, became a Pentecostal, you know, minister for a time. So that that's kind wow. of so th so those two you know sides of the family you know that kind of you know comes together, and then later you know later on my family transitions more into kind of like the word of faith you know stream you know stream mm -hmm. you know you know like Hagen Copeland you know that kind of mm -hmm. whole you know you know whole gamut of mm -hmm. things, and then you know fat you know fast forward I get thrown into you know you know the, the whole you know toronto you know stream you know rodney howard brown you know oh you know, yeah yeah he he came through here a couple of times and i actually saw him one time ministering at a catholic church just outside of philly this is back in the late 90s that was wow. that was uh that was pretty intense wow yeah. wow i i and see, I, I've heard of things like that happening, like where some of these charismatic pastors would go to Catholic churches, but I have yeah. never heard of a, and, a confirmed and, instance, if yeah, that makes and, sense. Yeah. And, well, the, the church that he went to, you know, for this particular charismatic conference, the, you know, the priest you know, of this parish you know, back then, uh, Monsignor Vincent Walsh, he was a, he, he was a pretty, pretty high up in the, uh, charismatic renewal in the in the Philadelphia area, and mm. so and so when you know Rodney Howard Brown's meetings started go getting going, he started going to Rodney's meetings, and then he went back to his parish, and the revival broke loose there. Yeah, and you know I think we could talk about all this stuff for hours. You know just how the movement. Um, had its high points and had its low points and had everything in between. Um, I think it would be safe to say that the charismatic renewal in the Catholic church started back in the, um, the fifties, I believe with um, a few um, students going to Duquesne universities and um, a, a prayer service and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, brought it back to their parishes, and it just caught like wildfire. Wildfire, yeah. and so much that um, several popes actually endorsed it. Um, Paul Paul the Sixth, I believe, endorsed yeah. it, and every pope after that has endorsed it. And so this is a movement that is, I think, in the grand um, whole gamut of Christianity, which I think. Is something that um, I agree that I can't, I, I don't know if it was um, Pope Benedict that said this or Pope John Paul II said this, that um, this is a great thing that will bring us together as Christians, the Holy Spirit, yeah, the Holy Spirit moving in both areas of faith. But anyway, that's a side note. <laughs> Um, so that was your background. What was the thing that led you to Christ? Were you always close to Christ or were you just, did you have that rebellious moment in your teens or, you yep, know, college? Yep. I, I know, you know, having been a PK, I know that, you know, those of us that, that have been PKs, we get, get a bit of a bad rap, you know, the oh, bad yeah. apples spoil it for, for everybody else. But I, you know, I wouldn't say I really had too much of a rebellious streak. You know, I mean, I was brought up in church, you know, I, I was one of those 
that basically, you know, as a little kid slept under the pews, you know, when prayer meetings are going late, you know, that's where I fell asleep, you know? And so, you know, even as a little kid, there were, I don't know how much of this was necessarily true faith or what, but, you know, if I would see someone pray for the sick, I would pray for the sick, you know, as a, as a little kid, you know, I used to play with Legos and I would set up, you know, that I would actually build like a little Lego church. You know, I would have a little Lego pastor and I would have him go down the line, lay hands on all the little Lego people and they would go down, you know, <laughs> that, that whole thing. Um, really where it clicked for me, I think it was back, you know, I was, I was 12 years old and I think it was around East, Easter time of 93. And I went to a passion play at a, a local church in the area. And uh, I remember when, when it got to that crucifixion scene, I think that's the moment where it became real, you know, to me, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, Jesus, you know, suffered and died, you know, in my place, you know, it just became personal right there. And at the end of, you know, at the end of the play, you know, after, you know, because what, what, what they did that was cool was they showed Jesus, you know, rather than just rising up from the dead, they, they went to where he descended into hell and, you know, kicked Satan's butt and took the keys, you know, from, you know, from him. And so after that, you know, the pastor at the church, you know, said, you know, if anyone here wants to give their life to Christ, you know, just pray, pray this prayer with me. And, you know, I prayed it and, it stuck, you know. I'm sure I'd prayed it before, but this was the time that for sure it was, you know, real, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that everybody has those conversion moments where they are like, "Aha, you know, Jesus is real," <laughs> you know, and um, I I remember attending a lot of those passion plays and how meaningful they are for people and you know how you know they would you know get somebody on fire for god for a while and then you know something would happen and then you know the fire would go away so hearing that it just stayed with you that's pretty remarkable that's very remarkable actually um what do you think Jesus is doing in the life of the church currently? What would you say? I, I from what from what I'm seeing, it's it seems like there's de there's definitely a uh, a line being drawn in the sand. You know, it you know the 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 season of of pew sitting is over. You know, it's mm -hmm. not it. You know. There, there, you, there, you, you know. There's, yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not any, that there's not graces attached to, you know, you know, coming to church on Sunday or whatnot. But, you know, what the Lord's doing with us now is, He's taking taking us, you know, past, you know, Sunday morning, and you know, equipping us to be soldiers, you know, the re the rest of the week, you know. Yeah. You know, there there's there's something about, you know, just this yearning, you know, for seeing, you know, seeing the gospel, you know, come alive in our lives. You know, you know, a lot of us have been raised in the church, you know, and you know, with the audience that we have here, you know, some have grown up, you know, going going to church every Sunday, you know, you know, he you know, hearing you know the gospel reading, hearing you know, psalm, psalm, hearing an epistle, you know, what, you know, Old Testament, whatever. And some, for some people, it's predictable, you know, it gets predictable and it's like, okay, what next, what now, you know? Yeah. But, but when you have an encounter with God, when God, when, or more so when God encounters you, you know, when you have that burning bush, you know, experience, you know, so to speak, you, you know, you realize, you know, this is, you know, God is demand, desiring everything of me. 
you know, mm-hmm. everything I am, everything I have, if Jesus Christ, you know, was willing to lay everything that he is of, of himself down for us, you know, how else can we respond but say, here I am, Lord? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a humbling experience because I was thinking about this the other day about how we're so we're just like a blip on the radar and Jesus's kingdom. And, you know, he's still he's reigning right now. He's going to reign forever. And we are given this short amount of time to do his will here on earth. Like, and we're, we're on the, we're at the most incredible time of a civilization. We, we can contact millions, millions of people at once, you know, and, you know, spread the gospel. And yet it's, I would say, and maybe you agree that the spirit seems like it's far from churches somewhat you know it maybe it's far from i i can see that kind of in the catholic church some somewhat you know there's for the catholic church you know we have mass we have the holy mass and it's you know it, it is what it is the service that we are most frequently attending and then they have these praise and worship services that are scattered throughout all these parishes i don't know if each parish does it but i know our parish does one and you know if anybody's going to receive the spirit it's going to be like the holy spirit or a a, a charismatic experience it's going to be at one of those places you know and so unless you're searching for it it's going to be hard to find yeah, And I feel like maybe sometimes in the Protestant world, it can happen. It's starting to happen in that way, too. Mm. You know, you know, it's not it's there's more seeker friendly churches now. There's more it's more about um, encountering God through consumerism than the spirit. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. And, you know, there. You know, there, you know, there, there's, there's nothing wrong with, you know, one of the things that I will give, you know, to give props to like the seeker sunset of seeker friendly movement is they strive to do things with excellence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I feel like sometimes, you know, in some of our, you know, I know, I know in my experience, you know, sometimes we think that the only way that God can move is if, we just show up, you know, without any plan, you know, unrehearsed, you know, unpracticed. And honestly, I've seen some of those situations be real train wrecks, but you know, there, oh, there's yeah. something, but there's something to be said for, you know, you, you practice, you know, you do it, you know, you do everything well, you make sure that, that your musicians, you know, sing on key or, you know, and play on key, you know, you, you bring your best to the Lord, you know, it's the, it's the first fruits principle, you know, you, you, you go to the Lord and you, you offer him the best you have. Yes. You know, and, but, but you come in with that, you know, with a heart that's expectant with a heart that says, Lord, you know, you know, even our best is not enough but we're building an altar here for you to, you know, send your fire upon these living sacrifices. And, you know, I mean, for, for the church, you know, the church I'm attending now, you know, I mean, they, they've struck a real good balance, you know, between, you know, being welcoming, you know, to, you know, you know, welcoming to seekers, you know, to people that have never been in the church, but, there's been a move of the Holy spirit just in the last couple of months where even where our pastor even has set aside whatever prepared you know, message he had. And they prepare like a year ahead of time, you know, even like sermon series and stuff. And our pastor has mm-hmm. been like, okay, this is going into back burner. Holy spirit's leading this way. You know, there's been ministry times 
you know, extending, you know, at, at different intervals of the services and, you know, testimonies just coming to people, you know, that are getting set free, people that are experiencing, you know, God's you know, love, God's healing, you know, God's saving power for the very first time. And, and as you say that, it makes me think about um, uh, this, this lady that I was watching on, um, I think it was on Pints of Aquinas, where she's, she's one of the head people of the Char Catholic Charismatic Renewal. She said something to the effect of, you know, God's healing people. People are going in, you know, wanting healing, you know. Yeah healing of their hearts, heal, I mean, healing of physical ailments too. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's scriptural. That's biblical. That's, you know, that is what we're commissioned to do. And so I think, I think it's all great, you know, and the, um, like people have a good heart for it. And I think people had a great heart for it in the beginning, but then like what you said is some of it just went off the rails because there wasn't a plan. There wasn't yeah. a foundation. There wasn't, you know, authority to um, check the spirits and check discernment, yeah. you know, just crazy stuff. Um, I remember one time in my dad's church, this guy just stood up and we didn't know him from Adam, you know, he just, stood up and s just started yelling, bring the scrolls across the city, bring the scrolls across the city, <laughs> you know, and we're like, what in the world? You right. know, because that's the way a lot of these charismatic churches operate, you know, mm -hmm. around that time is, you know, just free for all. Right. You know? <laughs> and, you know, um, God, I, I do believe that God wants us to, yeah, to, make sure that we have a plan in mind and, you know, we listen to the spirit ahead of time, you know, and, you know, um, of course we're, we're, we're in different faith backgrounds, but, you know, we, even in the Catholic church, you know, we, we ask the spirit to move on us through this liturgical time, you know, right. Lent and, you know, of Advent and, you know, what, what is he saying to us right now? And, you know, we have to go with that contrite heart and that open mind for the spirit to move. So yeah. enough rambling there, <laughs> <laughs> but um, what is one instance you felt the spirit was leading you undoubtedly in your life? Wow. So I'll, I'll just, you know, like, a, you know, I th one was definitely a preparation for marriage. You know, I, um, you know, I'm for, I'm 42 now. You know, my wife and I, we've been married since uh, October, you know, 2017. And, you know, I'll just, I'll just be honest, you know, for most of my adult life, I, I guess I, I knew I wanted to be married, but I just kept doing what, you know, doing whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, play, you know, playing my, uh, not, not video games, but, you know, I was big into anime, big into, I'm st you know, still into martial arts. I still do. But I remember there was a time where I was kind of away from church from church and not not being unbelieving but you know church hurt you know and i just you know it took me a while to get over you know some of that stuff and started going back to church and i remember this particular sunday uh there was a there was a guest speaker who actually you know he he was one of the early uh, vineyard guys in uh, New York City, and he was actually friends with uh, Lonnie Frisbee. Uh, he and he shared a testimony of 
you know, when he was at a meeting with Lonnie Frisbee and the Holy Spirit just wham, you know, just hit the place and just the transformation that ensued. And at the at, at the end of his, his message, he gave an altar call and, you know, it, it wasn't, he wasn't pushy. He wasn't, you know, like bullying saying, you need to come down here, you know, just very, you know, gentle, but straightforward. You know, it's like, it's time to lay it down. And I made a beeline for the altar. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't know if, it, I don't know if anyone else went up, but I know I did. You know? And yeah, you know, at that moment, you know, it was like just a dam just broke open. And I knew it was like, this is, this is it. You know, I've been, you know, holding back, you know, God's used me before, you know, I've been holding back, you know, you know, and you know, I started getting, you know, after that experience got reengaged in church life and ministry life, you know, and uh, one thing that I especially, you know, I started getting more serious about preparing for marriage. And one thing I felt that the Lord had me do, you know, and I was obedient to it was I stopped going to an, you know, anime conventions. You know, there was a particular mm. one I attended, you know, which it was fun and all, but, you know, just the atmosphere of it, right. a lot of, a lot of stuff, you know, just not conducive, you know, to, you know, to holy, you know, you know, holy life. And I felt like, making that decision to you know stop go attending that you know help propel things a lot quicker mm -hmm. and you know shortly after i think either before or after that i connected with a buddy of mine from that church who was also on a path you know of believing god for a wife and we would get together regularly to pray. You know, we would pray for like an hour or longer at a time, you know, just in tongues, you know, just praying in the spirit, you know, and, you know, just press, you know, pressing through whatever needed, you know, to be pressed through pushing. And, you know, we would go to like different meeting, <laughs> meetings, certain camp meetings and whatnot. And, you know, he got, he got married a year before I did. And then uh, I think it was short. I actually met the woman that's now my wife. I met her a month before my buddy got married. Wow. And when, and then, you know, fast forward, you know, fast forward to 2017, my wife and I get married. I was like, okay, you know, God's, God's in this, you know, I could oh, yeah. have, I could not have put, all that together, you know, in my mind, you know, the way, it, the way it came together, you know, wow, and, and God, and God definitely has a sense of humor too, because, because the way he set it up, you know, because it was, because my mom, my mom is the one that basically hinted to my wife, Hey, you should reach out to my son. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it was a setup. There, so. Thank you, mom. And, if you ever watch this, <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's that's um that's incredible too because every girl that my parents try to set me up with, I'm like, no, there's no chance, and <laughs> <laughs> I will be celibate for the rest of my life. <laughs> but it, you know, God, God, yeah, God brings the women in our life, and they they do propel us spiritually. <laughs> In and they say, and, and they sanctify us too. Sanctify us. <laughs> that's why the that's why it is a sacrament in our church. You know, it is, you know, for it's the only sacrament with um the or the the matter is to people, you know, because mm -hmm. you are supposed to edify each other and and you know, work in tandem with the Holy Spirit. I mean, just I'm you got the Holy Spirit in the in your corner 
I, yeah. I can't imagine you having that many marital problems, honestly. Right. So, you know, um, to kind of close up, we're, we're going to be talking a little bit about where do you think the Holy Spirit is? Um, we kind of talked about this earlier. Um, where do you see the Holy Spirit leading us in 10 year tier 10 years of the church? The next 10 years. Wow. Definitely. I definitely see the body of Christ, you know, right, you know, rising up, uh, you know, in a fuller expression uh, of the ministry of Jesus. Um, you know, in, in, in the in the charismatic circles, you know, especially like in you know, vin, you know, like vineyard renewal circles, there's always been th this emphasis on that, you know, the fivefold ministry's role is to equip the saints to mm -hmm. do, to do this to do the stuff you know yeah um and and say like the more liturgically oriented you know uh, tr uh churches uh a lot of people have this mindset you know where they they see essentially like the priest doing you know the ministry and everyone right. you know receives you know because the priest is duly <clears throat> <clears throat> duly ordained and duly authorized to you know confer the you know the sacraments mm -hmm. you know and we we recognize that but you know the priest can only reach so many people you know priests can you know there's priests can only you know go so many places you know the parishioners have access to people that the priest doesn't have access to you know yeah. and you know, I, I I believe that if uh, you know parishioners, you know, you know, catch a vision for, you know, the Lord using them in their respective spheres, you know, spheres of influence, you know, be it you know their schools, be it in their jobs, be it you know the supermarket, you know, where you know the restaurant, wherever they go, that they're available, they can be available to God, and He can use them however He wants to, that. They can pray for someone and see them healed. They can minister deliverance to somebody and see them them set free. They can evangelize, you know, and see uh, people, you know, converted, and and that works in tandem with the sacramental, you know, life of the church. You know, it's it's not in opposition to nor in competition with, you know, the you know the holy orders, you know. It, it's all complimentary. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think I think a lot of priests would be very happy if a lot of their people, you know, took up, you know, you know took up the call to do what Jesus did. <laughs> yeah, you know? no doubt. Um, I know I asked my priest today, I said, Father, how's the season going? And you can just see his face just like, oh. It's, I'm so busy, you know, and then I said, I said, Holy Week's coming up and he's like, oh, you know, he bemoaned, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just, you know, they're, they're more busier than we know they are, you know, yeah. they definitely deserve our prayers and uh, our gratitude. And right. one of the things we can do is share the load. So I do appreciate yeah. that. that's, that's a good message to get out to everybody. And, and you know, for anybody listen, you know, listening, you know, if you know, you know, priests that need a time, you know, of refreshing, that need a time to just kind of get away and be ministered to, you know, because priests, you know, give give so much priests and deacons, you know, give so much ministry, and sometimes they just need a, a focused time for them to receive, for them to be filled up, you know. If you if you know of any good conferences or retreats that they that your priests would appreciate, pay their way. You know, bless you know, bless them so that they can go ahead and be refreshed. You know, they'll benefit from it, and you'll benefit from it. Yeah, for sure. Well, we are about running out of time here, so um, why don't we go ahead and close in prayer? You know, I was meaning for us to open in prayer, but we just got right into it. So <laughs> let's go out on a high note here. So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Son, Spirit. Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Lord, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for your goodness and your um, gratefulness that you give to us. Lord, we thank you so much for being a merciful father. And Lord, we pray that you just um, continue to pour out your Holy Spirit upon your children that love you and serve you and that you just um, give them the tools and the, the, the things that they need to fulfill your will here on earth. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, the, the Holy, Son, Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for chatting with me, Jose. Um, we, you know, this is an ongoing thing that we're going to, that I'm going to continue doing, um, bringing some of, um, some of these people on to just share their testimony and share where they're at and where their heart is, you know, with, um, with our faith because it's a beautiful faith. So yeah. I appreciate you um, chatting with me tonight. But, you know, thanks for having me. Appreciate no it. No problem. Thank you. All right. Thank you.